Good afternoon. Welcome to Ran Rounds. Uh, this, this afternoon, we're going to have a discussion of exercise and bone health. Our two presenters are Christine Swanson and Wendy Court. Um, Wendy got her undergrad at, uh, at the University of Wisconsin uh, and then got a master's and a PhD at the University of Arizona, graduating uh, Phi Beta Kappa and did a postdoc at Wash U in St. Louis. Uh, she started on the faculty at Wash U. Uh, currently, she's a professor of geriatrics and, uh, and also obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Colorado. She's the associate director of the Women's Health uh, of, of the Center for w uh, Women's Health Research. And she's also associate director of the VA uh, Geriatric Research Center. She holds the Nancy Anschutz Chair in Women's Health Research. And she was the first woman to receive the Envi Environmental and Exercise Physiology Honor Award from the American Physiological Society. She's been on numerous NIH study sections and panels for uh, dealing with uh, issues of aging and exercise. She's on the editorial board of the Journal of Applied Physiology and is the associate editor of Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise. When I look through Wendy's uh, CV, I was struck by the fact that she has mentored over the years 62 MD, MDs, PhDs, postdocs, and nurses, and 52 of those are currently still in academic careers. Uh, she's uh, currently the PI and, and the site PI and the director uh, or co-director on six NIH grants and she's a co-investigator on an additional four grants. She has over 200 publications. The latest are relating to sleep, bone health, effects of exercise on body composition, and the effects of hormonal therapy on endothelial function across uh, the menopausal transition. Christine Swanson uh, did her undergrad at the University of Colorado. She got her MD at Tulane where she graduated AOA and won the Gold Humanism Award. She did a residency at Mayo Clinic Scottsdale where she won the David R. Sanderson Award and the Spirit of the Mayo Clinic Award, both of which recognized uh, core values of character teaching, patient care, and research. She did an endocrinology fellowship and a master's in clinical research at the University of Oregon, then did an endocrine research fellowship at the University of Colorado, joining the faculty. She's now an assistant professor in endocrinology, metabolism, and diabetes. She chairs the uh, Colorado Sleep Research Group, and she's the co-chair of the Colorado Bone Think Tank. She's funded with a K-2023 that is studying sleep disturbance as a novel risk factor for impaired bone remodeling. And she also has an RO3 studying bone turnover responses to sleep restriction and subsequent sleep recovery. So welcome to you both, and we look forward to your talk. Wendy? Thank you very much for that very kind introduction for both of us, Rick. Uh, as you can see on the, the uh, title slide here, neither Christine or I have any financial disclosures, but I think I should uh, disclose what I view as a conflict of interest. Uh, I'm trained as an exercise physiologist, and I harbor a deep-rooted belief that exercise should be considered as a therapeutic strategy either to prevent or treat many health conditions and diseases. Although by the end of my talk, you might think I don't believe that about exercise and bone health, but I do. So uh, these are the learning object objectives that were distributed with the announcement for Grand Rounds. And I'm gonna hand off to Christine as my uh, clinician colleague to introduce the, the clinical cases for you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I, we just have a couple of brief cases to help um, people frame how you think about exercise and bone health for your patients. So the first is a 20-year-old male who presents for evaluation of a right tibial fracture that he sustained during a basketball game. He reports he jumped up to block an opponent's shot, landed awkwardly on his right leg, resulting in an open tibial fracture that was subsequently surgically corrected with rod placement. He has no significant mass medical history. He didn't have any prior fractures. He has not currently or previously used glucocorticoids. He has no family history of metabolic bone disease. 
He had a normal puberty and is a healthy collegiate athlete with relatively normal dietary calcium intake, and he's not on any medications or supplements. He had um, normal bone density for uh, his age and sex, and a lab evaluation for secondary causes of this fracture was completely normal, um, including a 24-hour urine collection. And so what was it? Why did this healthy athlete experience such a tragic fracture during what seems like a routine game and maneuver? Our second case is potentially a little bit more common in your clinics. A 64-year-old woman uh, with a history of well-controlled hypothyroidism who presents for osteoporosis evaluation. Her 2018 DEXA, which is shown here, was consistent with osteoporosis. Um, at the lumbar spine, her lowest T-score was minus 2.6, uh, consistent with osteoporosis. And she had evidence of bone mineral density loss at all anatomical sites compared to her prior DEXA in 2015. She had no history of fracture and had never been treated for osteoporosis. She had good calcium and vitamin D intake. She was a former smoker, but quit almost three decades ago. She had no steroid exposure. She maintained a consistent, healthy weight, had a normal puberty and regular menstrual cycles until a normal menopause at age 51, after which she did not use hormone replacement therapy. And she's very physically active. She also had a thorough evaluation for secondary causes, which was negative, except for a high bone resorption marker, CTX, consistent with the bone density loss she had on DEXA. And she prefers natural treatment treatments and wants to know if exercise alone will protect her bones and lower her risk of fracture. Thank you, Christine. So with that, we'll launch into uh, my part of the talk today. I'm going to cover these four general topics and we'll start out by talking about whether exercise can prevent osteoporosis. I think it's probably widely believed uh, among the, the lay community and perhaps the medical community that exercise is effective as at preventing osteoporosis. But in fact, we have um, no randomized controlled trials, which is our higher level of evidence that has ever evaluated whether um, a regularly performed exercise can reduce the incidence of hip fracture. So re we rely on data such as those that I'm showing you right now come largely from prospective cohort studies. So just to orient you to this slide, um, these are um, the series of studies that were conducted in either women alone, in women and men, or in just men. And the point estimates indicate that the incidence of hip fracture in a group that was characterized through questionnaire uh, evaluation of how physically active they were. It's the, the incident of his hip fracture in the most active subgroup relative to the least active subgroup. The fact that all of these point estimates are to the left of one indicates that there was some benefit. Uh, when the confidence interval lines cross one, that is a non-statistical finding. But I think from this, we could conclude that maybe there's about a 30% reduction in the relative risk of hip fracture in people who report being highly physically active versus those who are more sedentary. But of course, from these type of data, we can't confer cause and effect. They could have other lifestyle habits um, in addition to being physically active that could have contributed to their lower risk for hip fracture. Um, there have been other approaches, small exercise intervention tr uh, trials, not looking at fracture as an outcome, but rather than uh, looking at bone mineral density as the outcome. And this is a recent paper that conducted um, a systematic review of those studies and then a meta-analysis to try to meet this lofty goal of developing an evidence-based guide to the optimal exercise prescription for preventing osteoporosis. These were their key takeaway take points, the types of exercise that they believe would be effective in meeting this, this goal. They suggest that people should do progressive resistance training at least two days a week, a variety of different types of exercises that target the muscles that either attach to or cross the hip and spine regions as the sites of most common osteoporotic fracture, um, and at a relatively high intensity, 70 
75 to 80 percent of the one repetition max, the highest amount of weight you could lift one time. They also suggest that, that people should engage in impact exercise that involves jumping or bench stepping, and that this should be done most days of the week, three to five sets of 10 to 20 jumps, that these should be relatively high impact and multi-directional to stress the skeleton in, in multiple ways. Interestingly, they also concluded from this meta-analysis that the intervention trials do not support an effectiveness of walking for preventing osteoporosis. And that previous slide I showed you, um, when, when people answer questionnaires about how physically active they are, the most common type of activity reported is walking. And in fact, the people who are at highest risk for osteoporotic fracture, postmenopausal women, I can tell you that a very small fraction of them practice progressive resistance training and impact type exercise. And the reason that uh, this group gave for why they believe walking is not effective is because based on animal studies, it seems like it takes a relatively high impact activities to have a meaningful uh, stress on the skeleton to bring about an anabolic effect. And if you look at the peak vertical ground reaction forces expressed in multiples of body weight, uh, walking is only, only generates forces that are about 1.2 uh, times body weight. So it's relatively low. Whereas uh, stepping activities, stepping up six inches or 12 inches, running activities, hopping, different types of jumping can all generate higher impact loading forces, which might be predicted to be more anabolic to the skeleton. Uh, and that's consistent with the, the theory that's been in place for many years for how exercise influences bone metabolism. So this is one inter iteration of Frost's mechanostat theory, which has been around for uh, more than 30 years. And this says that there's, uh, when you apply mechanical stress to the skeleton, that results in strain in bone. And the definition of strain is the, the magnitude of physical deformation that occurs. It's, it's in micro quantities. And there's this physiologic window of strain that results in uh, bone be, being in equilibrium. So the rate of bone breakdown or bone resorption is equal to the rate of bone formation and there's no net change in bone mass or bone density. But when um, high level loading forces are applied to the skeleton and result in a level of strain that's about 1500 to 2500 micro, micro strain, that's when anabolic processes are turned on such that the rate of formation exceeds the rate of resorption and bone gain will occur. And at the other end of the spectrum, when there's low level of stress on the skeleton, probably below 50 to 200 micro strain, that's where the anabolic processes are suppressed, the catabolic processes are still active, so the rate of bone resorption exceeds the rate of formation and there's net bone loss. There has been uh, one study that I'm aware of that has actually measured strain in humans by applying uh, strain gauges to the anterior tibia. So if we look at this from what the physiologic level of strain is, during walking activities, the, the amount of strain that occurred in the tibia was at the low end of that physiologic range, might be sufficient to maintain bone metabolism, but not an anabolic signal. Cycling is also in that low range. But when they looked at activities like running, jogging, going up and down stairs, now their forces or the levels of strain that were generated were super physiologic or in that area where you would expect anabolic activity to occur. And the same thing with jumping or hopping types of activities. But that's at the anterior tibia, and that might be a region where bone injury can occur, such as stress fractures, but it's not a common site for osteoporotic fracture. 
So this recent study in PLOS used a very sophisticated set of uh, strategies to come up with a non-invasive way to assess contact forces at certain joints and then be able to model through finite element analysis the type of strain that it develops. And I'm gonna show you data specifically from the femoral neck because that is a common site of osteoporotic fracture to try to estimate what types of strains develop with different activities. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, these are the various activities that they evaluated. All these uh, uh, um, things on the right end, these are hip uh, resistance exercisers, hip extension, abduction, flexion, and adduction down here at the end. Now remember from that meta-analysis meta I showed you, it was resistance exercise that was recommended as an uh, ideal exercise prescription. And yet um, in this study, the forces that were generated, the level of strain that was generated at the superior aspect of the femoral neck were among the lowest of the different activities that were assessed. They also looked at walking at different speeds, running and hopping activities. And I'm just pointing out here, walking at 3.7 miles per hour and running, jogging slowly at 5.6 miles per hour. And you can see that these activities seem to be more osteogenic than the hip resistance exercises, at least at this region of the femoral neck. So it should, this type of exercise should be effective at improving bone mineral density and reducing risk for osteoporotic fracture. Those were tensile strains. These are now the peak compressive strains that were generated. Again, you can see resistance exercise on the low end of the scale and running and walking up at the high end of the scale. So just a few takeaway points from um, what I've shared with you so far. Based on that last study, walking does appear to generate peak contact forces and strains that should have osteogenic potential at the proximal femur and specifically at the superior region of the femoral neck, which is very susceptible to, to osteoporotic fractures. And yet, from that previous study, walking intervention trials have been relatively ineffective at increasing or preserving hip bone mineral density. So we have this disconnect, and I'm gonna to suggest to you that at least part of the reason for this is that the, the bulk of research in this area has been heavily focused on mechanical characteristics of exercise that influence bone mineral density. And I think there has been little consideration to how metabolic factors associated with exercise influence bone metabolism. And the reason I think this is, is important is because we do have some examples of maladapted responses of bone to exercise training. So about 15 years ago, a young internist here at Colorado, Dan Barry, uh, wanted to join my research group. He was a former competitive cyclist and he was very interested in why cyclists as a group of athletes tend to have low bone mineral density. So the first study that he did was this uh, prospective study following a group of competitive cyclists over a year of training competition in their off season. And the common belief is that cyclists have low bone mineral density because they participate in a weight supported exercise rather than in weight bearing exercise. But if that was the case, these are young, healthy men. They shouldn't have been losing bone. They should have just not gotten the benefit of weight bearing exercise and just had a stable uh, bone mineral density over time. But what Dan found was that they were losing bone at a, a fairly alarming rate, almost 2% decrease in hip BMD. Uh, and that's um, not inconsistent with what we expect to see in postmenopausal women who have accelerated bone loss. And this is not limited to weight supported activity. Here's a study that I think has, has been buried through the years in a very reputa reputable journal showing that NCAA basketball players 
over the course of a season and their off season also have a loss of this time bone mineral content, not bone mineral density. And if I had to pick an exercise that is almost ideal for stimulating bone anabolism, it would be basketball because it involves sprinting and changing directions and jumping. So we don't understand why um, this sort of bone loss would occur in these types of athletes. I'm gonna ask you to remember this slide because I'm gonna come back to it a little bit later. And sometimes it's good to have somebody outside your field take a critical look at the evidence that, that's out there. So this is Gina Collada, a, a health reporter for the New York Times who published this article a few years ago saying that exercise is not the path to strong bones. And probably one of the most notable bone biologists and clinicians in our field, Cliff Rosen, uh, endorsed uh, what she said in this article. And I have been doing exercise and bone research for almost 30 years. And I can tell you that I was not really surprised by this because going back to the very first intervention trial that I conducted um, uh, 25 to 30 years ago, one of the most remarkable things I remember is that it was not easy to predict who would have the best bone response to exercisers to exercise the best exercisers did not necessarily have the best skeletal adaptations so i want to move to the third portion of this talk and focus a little bit on um, metabolic factors that i think are important so the question that guides our thinking on this is to understand why bone sometimes fails to adapt to exercise in the beneficial manner we expect it should. And our overarching hypothesis for this is that there is an acute activation of bone catabolism, bone resorption during exercise that counteracts or offsets some of the potential benefits uh, that mechanical stress has on bone. And um, when Dan Barry and I sat down many years ago to think about what those factors could be that could turn on bone resorption, we came up with a short list. We thought maybe it's the increase in stress hormones or cytokines during vigorous exercise that can activate these catabolic processes. Or maybe if we look at people who are exercising more chronically, that they, especially athletes, can get into a condition of low energy availability. Uh, and we know that the weight loss that can result from that is a cause of bone loss. And we also know that when you're in a condition of low energy availability, the gonadal axis is often suppressed. So there may be low sex hormone levels that are also associated with increased bone resorptive activity. And then the third one that we considered is whether there's a disruption of calcium homeostasis during exercise. And I'll tell you that I put these in the order of priority that I thought were most likely and least likely, but I let Dan pick which one he wanted to focus on and he picked the disruption of calcium homeostasis. I thought this was gonna be a dead end, but boy, was I wrong. I have continued to be amazed by the research we've been doing over the last 10 to 15 years. So I wanna share some of this with you. Our working model um, was based on that work we had done with cyclists. Cyclists as a group of athletes spend a lot of time on their bikes. So they sweat a lot and there's calcium and sweat. So we hypothesized that that sweat during exercise would lead to dermal calcium loss and trigger a decrease in the blood calcium level. Uh, that's something that we regulate very, very tightly. So even a small decrease in serum calcium should provoke an increase in, in parathyroid hormone and that can conserve calcium through several mechanisms, but the most immediate one is to go to the calcium vault, to go to bone, turn on bone resorption and mobilize calcium to prevent a further decline in the serum calcium level. We also put in here, and we thought that if this happened repeatedly with exercise, that that could contribute to the decrease in bone mineral density that Dan had observed in cyclists. 
We also uh, speculated that if we could provide supplemental calcium at the appropriate time, so it was in the gut ready to be absorbed during exercise, that that might diminish some of this cascade of events that occurs. So the first question we decided to address was right at the top of this, this cascade. We wanted to determine whether it truly is dermal calcium loss that is the trigger for these increases in PTH and CTX. And the experiment that we designed was very straightforward. We had about 24 healthy young men and women who uh, completed two exercise sessions. This was an hour of cycling at a relatively high intensity in either cool or warm conditions. And we picked the temperatures so that the warm condition should generate a sweat rate that was 50% higher than the cool condition. And we met that. So estimated sweat loss was 50% higher the sweat calcium concentrations were the same, so they lost 50% more calcium in the warm condition. And yet, none of these responses were different among the two conditions. There's a decrease in ionized calcium in both cases. There was a robust increase in PTH, and there was this increase in this biomarker we have of bone resorption activity. This is the c telopeptide of type one collagen, which is the thought to be the best indicator of bone resorptive activity. A Couple of things I'd like to point out here is that uh, in addition to there being no difference between the warm and cool conditions, the fact that all of these things happened just 15 minutes into exercise, that's when this huge increase in PTH occurred, Yes, they had started sweating at that point, but there had been just negligible, negligible amounts of calcium loss. So this really told us that dermal calcium loss is not the key here. The other thing I'd like to point out, and uh, this is something if, if people understand exercise physiology, is that anytime we see an increase in something during exercise, we have to look at whether that is a real increase in secretion of PTH or whether it's an artifactual increase. And the reason for that is that a very well-described phenomenon that happens during vigorous exercise is a contraction of plasma volume. And that can be a 10 to 15% decrease in plasma volume, which means that everything that's left, all the solid constituents become hyper-concentrated. So we did the adjustment for plasma volume changes. And at least for PTH and CTX, you can see that the pattern remains the same. The, the, the actual concentrations are decreased just a little. But I was shocked by what we saw here in terms of the change in ionized calcium. Um, this was a decrease of a milligram per deciliter in the first 15 minutes per uh, of exercise. That's a, uh, an efflux of calcium out of the vascular space. That's about 20 to 25% of the free calcium that's there. I thought it was a mistake. It wasn't. This is, this is correct, and we've repeated it several times. I thought it was a novel observation, but when I dug down into the literature, I found papers back in the 1970s and early 80s describing this exact phenomenon also this robust. I'll tell you, this is one question we haven't addressed or, or even begun to try to answer. I don't know why there is that loss of calcium from the vascular space. I don't know what the fate of that calcium is, but this demonstrates that exercise provokes a huge disruption in calcium homeostasis. So going back to our model, we uh, eliminated that first step. There are other factors that trigger the decrease in serum calcium. We don't quite know what that is yet, but we did see the decrease in calcium. We saw the increase in PTH. We saw the increase in bone resorption. The next question to address was whether supplemental calcium could modify this. And we've done a series of studies here, but I wanna go to the one that I think is the most definitive 
And that's whether if we could find a strategy to prevent the decrease in calcium, would we then prevent the increases in PTH and CTX? So we developed a novel approach to do this. First time ever, Christine was scared to death to do this, but we infused calcium gluconate during exercise to prevent the decline. So we, we started this, the infusion about 15 minutes before they started their exercise. We raised the serum calcium level by about 2.2 mg per deciliter. And then we measured the serum ionized calcium level every five minutes so we could adjust the infusion rate to prevent the decrease. This was done in uh, some young men. Uh, again, our vigorous exercise cycling for one hour. And we did a control condition here, which was volume matched saline infusion. So if you look first of all at just the green lines, these show you the same patterns that I showed you in the previous slide. Decrease in calcium during exercise, huge increase in PTH, and a huge increase in CTX or bone resorption. And this time we carried the recovery interval out for four hours. So the key thing to remember here, and I want you to remember this for later on, is that the increase in PTH is transient. It comes back down to baseline by an hour after exercise. But despite that, CTX or bone resorption is still going up an hour after exercise, and it remains elevated for at least four hours, concerning to me. Um, but when we infused calcium, our clamp was successful. We prevented calcium from decreasing below the pre-exercise level, and that initially drove down the PTH, but essentially uh, decreased the PTH response by 70% compared to the saline condition. And same thing with CTX. We prevented about 70% of the increase in this bone resorption marker. And uh, similar to our previous study, when we adjusted for plasma volume contraction, again, we saw this huge decrease in, in uh, calcium content in the vascular space that was only partially mitigated by our calcium infusion. And we had to administer on average about 120 milligrams of calcium to maintain that level to prevent calcium from dropping, the unadjusted calcium level from dropping. So there's a lot of calcium that's being moved during exercise. So this is great. It gave us a lot of insight in what happens in healthy young adults, but they're not the people who are at increased risk of osteoporosis. So does this disruption of calcium homeostasis occur only during cycling activity? And does it occur only in young adults? So we went to the opposite end of the spectrum here. We did that same clamp experiment in older uh, women and men who also did two identical exercise sessions with calcium gluconate or saline. And this time we just did treadmill walking at about 80% of their maximal heart rate. That sounds like a very vigorous exercise bout, but this is brisk walking for this, this uh, age group of individuals. It was walking on the treadmill at about 3.6 miles per hour, level grade. And showing you the same sort of responses here, you can see that they are essentially identical to what we observed in young adults. And let me just put up the young adults from that previous study I showed you. So top panels are older adults during treadmill exercise. Bottom panels are young adults during vigorous cycling exercise. We see essentially the same response. So we've seen this in young and older women and men, trained, untrained. We don't think this is an adapt. There is an adaptive response to exercise training. We think this occurs with relatively vigorous exercise. We also wanna know if um, providing supplemental calcium, either dietary or supplemental before exercise might be effective. So this is a, a paper that's not been published yet where um, um, this was young adults had a, a meal two hours before exercise that was either high in calcium, about a gram, or low in calcium, about 200 milligrams. 
And um, you can see that the high calcium meal was associated with an attenuation of both the PTH and the CTX responses. So this looks very promising for using pre-exercise calcium to try to attenuate the bone resorption response. One other point I'll make with this is that we included um, an isotope, a stable isotope of calcium in this meal so that we'd be able to see when calcium was appearing from the gut into, into the bloodstream. So this is the point where the meal was administered. Within one hour, we can see this, this calcium isotope appearing. So uh, absorption is apparent by that time. And something that's uh, common in, in the exercise science community is this concept that absorption of nutrients from the gut during exercise probably does not occur because most blood flow is shunted away from the gut toward working muscles. But these data suggest that is not true, that even during exercise, there was a a robust increase in the ability to absorb calcium from the gut. So I think we have more work to do in this area, but it definitely suggests that this is a promising uh, strategy to try to attenuate the PTH and, and CTX responses. And we think the timing of calcium administration is gonna to prove to be very important because it has to be in the small intestine and transit time through the small intestine is relatively fast. So going back to our model, we now have evidence that supplemental calcium does in fact attenuate this cascade of events. What we haven't looked at yet is whether there's an impact on how bone mineral density responds to exercise. So I'm taking you back to the study of the NCAA basketball players that I showed earlier. What I didn't tell you is that this study was continued for a second year when they saw the, the large decreases in bone mineral content in that first year, they also measured uh, sweat calcium. They actually had guys take off their t-shirts after practice, they wrung them out, and they estimated that these athletes were losing three to 400 milligrams of calcium uh, an hour during a, a regular training, uh, a practice session. So in the second year of following these athletes, they provided them with supplemental calcium. And I think the key point of this study is they provided them with a drink that they were supposed to take during practice and before games that contained calcium. So uh, the timing of calcium was relative to when they were exercising. And they showed a reversal of the trends in year two so that there was actually an increase in bone mineral content. Now, this wasn't a controlled experiment, so we can't say that these changes were attributable to um, the mechanisms that we're, we're gonna hypothesize were related to it. We need to do more follow-up work on this. So the key take-home points here are that there is a very robust acute catabolic response of bone to vigorous endurance exercise. We've not studied resistance exercise, so we don't know if it also generates this PTH response. Uh, as I mentioned, this occurs in young and older, women and men during weight-supported and weight-bearing endurance exercise, regardless of their training status. And we believe that this is a necessary and appropriate regulatory response to mobilize calcium from bone as a way of preventing that decrease in calcium from progressing to a harmful level. Because if it goes too far, the worst outcome you could have from this is cardiac arrest. So there must be a counter-regulatory response that's gonna prevent calcium from decreasing too much if the exercise is too prolonged or too vigorous. As I mentioned, the reason for this loss of calcium from the vascular space is not known. We don't know where it's going. We think maybe skeletal muscle because of the involvement of, of calcium and muscle contraction, but we're not sure about that yet. And we have evidence now that providing pre-exercise calcium can attenuate this response to some degree. But 
we have to spend just a couple of minutes on the last uh, the last agenda item here today. So despite the evidence I've shared with you, don't start taking that calcium supplement before you exercise just yet. And the reason for that is because parathyroid hormone has paradoxical actions on bone. When it's elevated chronically, it is toxic. It causes osteoporosis. But when there are daily transient increases in PTH, it's anabolic. And in fact, there are PTH-like drugs, teriparatide and abaloparatide, that are used to treat osteoporosis. To just show you some of these data, these are bone marker responses to a single injection of teriparatide showing that over 12 hours, there's an acute catabolic response, an increase in CTX, and it doesn't become anabolic until at least 24 hours later. Same thing here, looking at four hours after exercise. And I just created this figure to show that the exercise-induced increase in PTH that we've observed in young men, that's the red line, relative increases, are very similar to the relative increases in CTX in response to a single dose of teriparatide also in young men. And if we look at changes in these bone biomarkers over long-term, these are studies that had daily injections of teriparatide for 12 weeks. This top panel is, is uh, studies of postmenopausal women. You can see that over 12 weeks, this is a marker of anabolic activity in bone, bone formation, P1NP, get a doubling to a one and a half fold increase in P1NP by 12 weeks with very small increases in catabolic activity. And down on the bottom panel here, these are not uh, postmenopausal osteoporosis, but rather other conditions of, of uh, bone disease. So this is spinal cord injured patients, women with anorexia nervosa and uh, premenopausal with idiopathic osteoporosis. And again, you see this one to two fold increase in P1NP anabolic activity. Um, and with the exception of, exception of spinal cord injured patients who just have very high bone resorptive activity, uh, relatively low resorptive uh, activity increases. And we have not measured P1NP responses over time in response to exercise training, but others have. So these are just a few studies to show you relative to the changes that occur with PTH-like medications, the exercise-induced increase in PTH does not seem to have nearly the same anabolic effect, relatively modest increases, if any, in P1NP over time. So final key points here are that vigorous endurance exercise has this acute catabolic effect on bone as evidenced by increases in PTH and CTX subsequent to a decrease in serum calcium. This increase in PTH may also have an anabolic effect, but we don't have evidence for that yet. Um, it, um, I don't need to go over the rest of this. So our, our working model is that exercise via mechanical loading characteristics can activate bone formation and be very good in terms of building stronger bones. But we believe that these metabolic characteristics of exercise require more attention because the PTH activation of bone resorption is really very robust and has the potential to offset the benefits of the mechanical loading characteristics. We still need to study whether that PTH generates an anabolic signal, regardless of whether it does or not. We still need to be studying both of these simultaneously to determine what the net effects of these two processes are going to be on influencing both the mass of bone that's there and the quality of bone that's there. And Kathleen, I'm handing off to you, or Kathleen, Christine, I'm handing off to you. Thanks, Wendy. 
Um, so just to circle back to our two brief cases, the first was the 20 year old male with the open tibial fracture during a basketball game. This may have sounded somewhat familiar to some of you. It was loosely based on Kevin Ware, who sustained an open tibial fracture during the first half of an Elite Eight game in March of 2013. I'll decided to spare you the photos since some of you may be eating. Um, he ended up getting surgical repair and returned to basketball later that year. He finished his college career at Georgia State University and then went on to play professional basketball in Europe, Canada, and Great Britain. Um, case one also highlights that although um, black individuals are traditionally thought to be at lower fracture risk, they can still fracture and should have their fracture risk assessed in the appropriate context. Case two follow-up, this was our 64-year-old female with postmenopausal osteoporosis who was interested in exercise um, to treat her osteoporosis. She did that for a year, but her bone, repeat bone mineral density was still consistent with osteoporosis, and she continued to have bone density loss at all sites, such that now her lowest T-score was minus 2.7 at the lumbar spine. Her CTX, that marker of bone resorption, was still elevated and more so than it was in 2018. And so she started zolandronic acid, also known as Reclass, um, to treat her osteoporosis, decrease her fracture risk, and hopefully slow or halt the bone density loss she had experienced. Thank you, Christine. And I just want to put this slide up to acknowledge uh, our research group. We refer to ourselves as the image group, investigations in metabolism, aging, gender, and exercise. Um, our sponsors for the work that we've done and the other center affiliations that we have. And I, I hope we have uh, some good questions that we can, can address. Thank you both very much. Uh, terrific presentation. Um, <clears throat> I, I was struck by the fact that the change in calcium with exercise occurred almost immediately with the onset of exercise. It seemed to me to be uh, changing w way faster than you could explain loss in sweat. You're not even sweating in the first 30 seconds or minute. And it suggested some sort of, uh, of, uh, tr of transcellular movement, maybe a pH effect or a hormonal effect, cortisol. Uh, it seemed to be too fast for any sort of chronic metabolic process or, or um, uh, development of some intracellular issue, suggesting maybe some glucose transporter relationship relative to exercise. Has that ever, uh, have you thought about that at all? Well, we've been thinking about it a lot, Rick. And um, I've been asking, you know, I've given this talk many times to a variety of audiences and I, I try to provoke uh, the, the, this type of question so we can have a discussion of it. Um, I, and I've read the, the, the older papers that have described this phenomenon and everybody seems perplexed at the magnitude of the change and the rapidity of the change. Yeah. And, and I, I'm, I'm a little bit stumped in terms of what drives it and why, what, what purpose it serves. So we, we really need to do much more work in this area, but it really does suggest that it's not dermal calcium loss. It is probably this, this efflux from the vascular space that is driving this. And I didn't have a chance to go into this, but another interesting observation that's come about of, over the last 10 years ago is that endurance athletes, um, um, are also being found to have elevated um, coronary artery calcification scores. Oh. And I don't know if this is mechanistically related to all this calcium that is going back and forth across vascular um, um, membranes, but it seems um, like interesting coincidental evidence that both of these things are occurring. And so um, I'm going to give cardiology grand rounds, uh, I guess maybe after the first of the year, and <laughs> see if I can uh, get some cardiologists interested in this. Um, another thing I wanted you to comment on is your second hypothesis, the hormonal uh, causes of, uh, of these changes uh, with heavy exercise. Uh, I've seen some uh, elite exercisers, if you will, with osteoporosis and have seen the change attributed to differences in testosterone and, uh, 
and um, potentially other hormones. Uh, are you pursuing that line of uh, work at all? We are somewhat, but not not very vigorously. That first study that Dan Barry conducted, we we did measure changes in body composition, and there were none over that one year. We did measure uh, total and and bioavailable uh, T levels, and there were no changes. So you know that that didn't seem quite as fruitful. But we certainly know from what is often referred to as the female athlete triad yeah. um, that um, when they have low energy availability, the the overt marker that women get is um, amenorrhea, um, yeah. and that is associated with very accelerated bone loss. So this it it could be a contributing factor also. Okay, some questions from our audience. Um, uh, from Irene Schauer, uh, Scheuer, uh, I would think that acute PTH elevations during exercise would be similar to the PTH injectables that we use to improve bone density. Yeah, I would think so too, but um, we, we don't, we haven't seen a signal yet to, to um, that that exercise induced increase in PTH is generating the same anabolic signal as the PTH injectables, teriparatide or abaliparatide. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a pending VA merit application that will, um, that will investigate that more vigorously. And I think we'll have definitive evidence then. Um, next, uh, it, if this process, uh, if vitamin, if it's vitamin D controlled and whether they want to know whether higher vitamin D levels uh, can attenuate the response. Well, I'll tell you that all of our participants in the studies that I shared with you had normal vitamin D levels. Uh, but I also think that um, I'll let Christine address this because I know she has some thoughts on that. Well, I was gonna, yeah, they have to have a minimum by 25 hydroxy vitamin D level of 20 to be eligible for the study. Um, and in theory, you would need adequate vitamin D to absorb calcium from the GI tract. So in any calcium supplementation studies, um, but the, all, of, all of the studies Wendy has done has have been on participants with adequate vitamin D levels. So we haven't really investigated those with vitamin D deficiency or, or higher levels. Okay, we have two questions that are dealing with exercise. The first is, is there any thoughts about heavy squats or sit to stands for some? And the second is, uh, so what are the best recommendations for exercise type, <laughs> given the data that for older men and women, given the data that you reviewed? Yeah, you know, I think this is I, why I can't retire until I answer um, the, <laughs> the questions that are remaining, because I, I used to think that I knew <laughs> what that exercise prescription should be for bone health. And uh, over the last 10 years, I've just come to question whether it is appropriate. Let me just say this, that uh, the studies in animals, first of all, many of them don't address the metabolic characteristics because they use a, an experimental model of loading. So if they use a, a rodent, they put the forelimb in a device and the load is applied uh, through a mechanical device, not through uh, physiologic mechanisms. So they don't see any of these other systemic factors that could be influencing the response. Um, and what has come out of those studies is that the best type of loading paradigm to influence boat metabolism is high intensity loading, but only for very brief durations of time. So about 100 loading cycles per day is thought to optimize the, the bone formation response. Now the question in these animal models, if it continues longer, there hasn't been good evidence that it's detrimental, but um, they've described this as bone losing its sensitivity to mechanical stress after only a couple of minutes. So if, if we try to translate that to what's best for humans, it might be that resistance exercise that is just brief intervals of muscle contractile activity might truly be the best. 
or shorter intervals of uh, weight-bearing endurance exercise. But as, as Rick pointed out, what we are seeing occurs very early in exercise. And this is going to lead to a dilemma. I'm not very popular among my exercise science colleagues because I'm suggesting there's a potential detrimental effect of a type of exercise that is recommended for cardiovascular and other benefits. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm walking a fine line here to say, I don't know what the best exercise is for bone given our current, our, our current state of knowledge. Uh, okay, um, another question. When looking at the drop in bone density of athletes uh, mid or post season and the potential that natural calcium fluctuations with PTH could play a role in bone anabolism, how do we look at that compared to the anabolic effects of PTH analogs? Well, I'll tell you the way we want to look at it, a couple of ways. We're gonna do some studies where we just provide calcium supplementation uh, before exercise versus a placebo and put these for people through a training program to see if we get variable uh, increases in bone mineral density. Um, perhaps a more direct way that we want to study this is to randomize people to either exercise or teriparatide therapy. And so if the exercise is gonna be four days a week, they would get their teriparatide injections four days a week. And we would do very uh, in-depth characteristics of the, the bone turnover responses to both exercise and teriparatide so that we would have a direct comparison of them and then do this over a few weeks. So I showed you that the anabolic effects of, of teriparatide are profound after 12 weeks. So if we did the same sort of intervention with exercise for 12 weeks and characterized the bone turnover markers at beginning, midpoint of, of the intervention at the end, that's where I think we will get this, <laughs> um, the best knowledge about whether endogenous increases in PTH provoked by exercise are as anabolic as exogenous. PTH-like drugs. Okay. Um, do the calcium fluxes during the experiments correlate with post-exercise muscle cramps? Uh, I don't think we've had anybody with post-exercise muscle cramps, uh, so I can't answer that. I think one interesting experiment I would like to do, just a descriptive study, is to uh, enroll patients who have had a parathyroidectomy and see how they respond to exercise. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Christine do that study. Well, they, they wouldn't have taken out all four parathyroid glands yeah. in, in all likelihood, <laughs> at least not by design. <laughs> Yeah, but, but whether they have a, a decrease in their reserve to be able to yeah. stimulate the same sort of response that we see with exercise. Christine? Yeah, I don't have a comment on the parathyroidectomy um, design, study design, but just to tack on to the questions about exercises for bone health, I think part of, you, part of the benefits of exercise, you know, should hopefully we can determine what exercises are most beneficial to the bone itself. But some of the benefits for exercise in postmenopausal osteoporosis and older individuals is the effect on falls and balance that can help prevent the fracture with the low bone density or osteoporosis. So um, things like Tai Chi are great for um, uh, affecting balance in older individuals. And so um, hopefully we can do a little bit more research to define exactly what the best exercise prescription is for bone anabolism, but there are benefits of exercise to bone just in the prevention of falls and, and fractures in that way. Thanks. And one last question, just out of curiosity, Wendy, what's the, me uh, the method by which you correct for the plasma volume change? You know, we um, have gone to using just hematocrit because we've yeah. got a point of care device that we uh, use for measuring ionized calcium and we can get that very easily. I would say a little bit more rigorous approach is to use both hematocrit and hemoglobin. We use the old Dill-Costal equation from the early 70s. 
Um, and we've compared those two and they're very close. So that that's the approach we use. And do you uh, do you do that repeatedly during out during the course of exercise or just beginning and end? Uh, we do it for every sample that we collect. Every time sample. Yeah. Very yep. interesting. Well, yep. thank you both for very uh, interesting and uh, provocative discussion. Um, I still don't know how how much exercise I'll do, but that's where I'm going to go now. <laughs> so thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thanks all. Thank you.